Off you go. Well, hello, universe. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for being here with us today. I want to say thank you to all of you for coming um, to, to this presentation and also to Dr. Frederica and I like you on your last name right now uh, for putting this event together and for bringing a, a guest uh, from Europe to visit us today. This is one of uh, the events of International Education Week and I have put um, a brochure here at the table for all of you to see. Um, International Education Week is um, a week that we, that the Department of State and the Department of Education have chosen to, uh, for all universities across the world, to celebrate the benefits of international education, so transformation of global experiences, exchange of ideas and cultures and languages. Um, we do this here at Appalachian all year round, but this is one <coughs> where we're just all coming together to you know, do a, a lot of concentrated celebration of those um, transformational experiences. So I have here, we're halfway through the week. We started on Monday, today's Wednesday evening. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to highlight for the rest of the week. Tomorrow, um, we're having a session on Fulbright scholarships for students. So any of you students who are interested in learning more about how to get a Fulbright scholarship, which is um, one of those prestigious scholarships that you can all apply for. I keep saying Appalachian provides excellent education and you're all eligible for it. You can all do it. Uh, please come and find out about it. So at 6.30 tomorrow night, they have free pizza. So please come out. Then afterwards, international students are doing a trivia night at Black Cat Cafe and or Burrito, I think it's called. Um, please come out for that. They're usually really fun. And I was there last year and I didn't do as well as I thought I would with someone working in an international office. Um, and then on Friday, uh, about 300 students are going to get together and showcase their cultures, dancing, music, food, what better can you ask for on a Friday evening? So please have, come and join us uh, for that. I didn't think I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Maria Anastasio, and I work in the Office of International Education and Development, which is the office that puts this whole week together, of course, with the support of the different departments. So with that, um, oh, last thing I wanted to say, anyone who comes, the, third, the first 30 students who come to, I need to move over here, the first 30 students who come to um, five events of International Education Week are earning this beautiful t-shirt right here, I'm cutting it out, and I'll be happy to sign um, the event for tonight that you attended, okay? So with that, I'm going to let Dr. Federica introduce our guest tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for helping in organizing this. And first of all, thank you for Dan German. You might not know him, but if this event is here, if I am here, is thanks to him being an excellent, such an excellent professor that his former student created an endowment to create this chair and to have some money to organize events like this. So thank you, Dan, again. And it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Fabio Franchino. It's a colleague and friend. Uh, we met when we were PhD students. Fabio got his PhD from the Landwood School of Economics and is now a full professor at, in political science at the University of Milan. He's also the director of the Italian Political Science Review, which is now, which transitioned from being a domestic review into an international one published in English by Cambridge Press. And, and he's also the president of European Political Science Association. Now, the topic of tonight is the future of Europe. What is going to happen? Uh, and I was actually expecting more flirtation after the, after, the American, after the American elections. And why the Europe could be in trouble if the Europeans don't go forward in, have, in creating a fiscal policy. So Fabio will give an introduction and then we'll go on with Q and A. Thank you very much. Fabio, off you go. <coughs> Again, Twitter. <laughs> Please. <coughs> okay, thank, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a, it's a, it's a great pleasure. I, I must admit that um, this is a very familiar setting because I come from the Alps, and and, uh, um, and so it's very very similar to, to the setting that it's uh, um, 
around here. So it's a, it's a very nice pleasure to be here. Never been around the Appalachian uh, in the US. Um, we, I chose a title which I realized then when I was talking with Erika Bindi, which is a bit technical, I understand. Um, and the future of the euro is probably easier to, to, to um, uh, as a message of the talk that I'm going to say, but the essence of this talk is exactly the challenges that uh, the euro, the eurozone is facing, are facing, and um, the um, with regard, and, and also the challenges with regard to how um, European Union institutions and European Union uh, uh, politicians are trying to um, face, what they're trying to do with regard to these specific challenges. Um, as you are very well aware, the Eurozone has faced a um, significant, um, I would say, existential threat in the past years. Uh, things are now have been improving, but it's been a very serious um, crisis. The so-called the Euro, as you know, as you probably are aware, uh, the sovereign debt crisis, which has the Euro uh, as phase of the past uh, um, after the, the, the global financial crisis. Um, what I'm going to show you now, I'm going to show you um, three charts, which in my view summarize. Um, how this crisis has, a, has an impact, has an impact across across the Euro and the Eurozone, across the European Union and the Eurozone. And uh, then we're going to discuss a bunch of uh, um, one policy, which has been discussed as a way to solve some of these problems which have emerged. Some of the talk can be a bit technical. I might skip some parts and then, you know, just to focus on the um, most fundamental aspect of this talk. So. Let's have a look at these three charts. Um, the first one display uh, the dispersion in um, per capita across domestic product uh, um, across three groups of countries. Okay, um, you see the uh, the straight line at all the European Union countries. As you might be aware, only a subset of the European Union countries have the euro. Have the euro. So the second line is. Uh, um, only the country having the eurozone, and the third the dotted line, the, the slight dotted line, uh, the eurozone 12, which are these are the 12 eurozone countries that uh, um, were the original members of the eurozone in when it was launched in uh, 2000. And, no, physical coins were introduced in 2001. Um, so what is this uh, chart is showing us? Is showing the dispersion in in per capita uh, gross domestic products. And I, I, you see, as you notice, that I saw the chart there, which is exactly on 2009, when on the onset of the European um, sovereign debt crisis. What happened next? And that's what happened next. As you can see here, the dispersion in per, uh, per capita gross domestic product has significantly increased across the, um, Euro, the original 12 Eurozone countries. It's been actually slightly lower uh, for the um, other Eurozone countries. And it is even lower in terms of uh, um, your own European Union countries. So essentially, an important impact of, the, of that crisis was actually increased heterogeneity in, uh, um, in economic uh, development across those countries. Um, much higher within the Eurozone countries and lower in the Eurozone overall. And uh, I'll say the second chart shows a, a, a similar development, but with regard to unemployment rates. Okay, up until 2009, the unemployment rates has been very similar across the Euro European Union and the Eurozone countries, but it has, the dispersion has increased considerably, um, especially within the original 12 members. Then a, bit, a little bit less about the in the all the Eurozone countries and uh, in the um, European Union. So, what are these two charts telling us? These two charts are telling us that um, economic divergence has increased significantly more within the eurozone and especially within the 12 eurozone countries okay so that's that's what these two charts are telling us and uh, um, the last chart that i'm going to show you uh, tell us a different story but also extremely inform informative as well this is the dispersion in government expenditure as percentage of gdp okay so this is a measure of uh, how the, the, the heterogeneity in the fiscal spending across different Eurozone countries. As you see, essentially, um, it's been 
who are more or less similar, so essentially low, but lower within the origin of 12 eurozone countries. Uh, but you know, not not very different sort of dynamics across these countries. But as you see in these periods, following the um, eurozone country, uh, following the crisis, uh, this dispersion has been lower. Okay, uh, which across across the original eurozone countries, 12, and then even a um, little bit higher in the eurozone, even higher across the European Union. So, what is this chart telling us? Um, what is telling us is that uh, there has been economic di di divergence within the Eurozone, but economic convergence in terms of fiscal spending. Um, so essentially what this chart is telling us is that uh, in the Eurozone, what actually happened is that we had a so-called one-size-fits-all monetary policy, because they're a member of the, of the single currency, right? I mean, they face very similar monetary conditions, but they also have a one size fits of its all fiscal policy because there's been much more homogeneity in terms of fiscal policy um, within the Eurozone countries compared to the other ones. Okay? But clearly, the consequences of this is that actually greater economic divergence, as we've seen from the chart on uh, GDP growth and unemployment. Um, well, this can be the, res the result of dynamics, which I'm, I'm not going to talk about this right now. If you have any questions, there are some rationale behind these outcomes. So essentially, this is, um, is this irrelevant? Is this an important aspect? Okay. <clears throat> Should we care? Um, is, that, is that relevant? Is that, is, that, is that an important issue that there is greater diver economic diversion between Eurozone and there is actually convergence in terms of fiscal policy? Uh, should we care about these increased divergence? Well, um, I think the best way to answer these questions is to look at different, let's say, monetary unions across, uh, across, across the world. So what happened in other uh, economic areas that share a, 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 a single currency? And the most fitting comparison, not for any specific you know, ambitions of being like the, 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 the United States, is actually the United States. The essential reasons why it's a very fitting comparison because the United States is a non-solidaristic federation, okay? The U.S. U.S. Uh, uh, constitutions doesn't include specific provisions to um, 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 for the transfers of funds across states. Okay, while it is present, for instance, in the Canadian and in the um, um, Australian constitution, for instance. Okay. However, even though um, the U.S. is not particularly as a constitution, it's not particularly solidaristic. Uh, in the U.S., um, as a result of essentially centralized taxation and spending, um, centralized taxation and spending has a significant impact in the divergence of economic dynamics across U.S. states. Um, in the U.S., transfers from either, from the center, from the from the states to either individuals or states, the, it cashes a, a, a more or less 24 percent of the dispersion, okay, in state level income. So clearly also in the U.S. there is significant you know, uh, divergence in state-level income. But common uh, fiscal and spending policies, they operate essentially to, to cut cash and this, to cushion this uh, di uh, dispersion in, in state-level income. Of this, essentially 11% is short-term, so it's, it's there in order to uh, um, manage the short-term fluctuations in the cycle. The remaining is actually long term, which is actually in order to redistribute it, it, what it does de facto, it distributes resources from the richer states to the poorer states, even though that is not really written in the constitution. Okay. Um, so this is an example of what, what we might call a non solidaristic uh, um, monetary union, like the US. What can we say? This is the result, as I said, this, this moving results from centralized taxation and spending. What can we say about the, um, the European Union? Well, the European Union you know, um, has a very, very limited common spending. This is the budget of the European Union, which is essentially you know, 1.8 billion in the Eurozone countries uh, uh, across this particular time period. So it's very, very, very limited, okay? Uh, which represents about 0.53% of the gross, um, um, gross national income. So the fact that the European Union as a monetary union is even less 
less solidaristic than, than a, a, a federal states like the US, which does not provide these constitutions solidaristic uh, um, provisions. So, uh, there's been a significant debate in Europe about the creation of a fiscal union, okay? the, um, um, which is an instrument which would be designed to smooth the, 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 the business side of fluctuations across different um, countries of the Eurozone. Um, uh, a fiscal union in the Eurozone is, is, it, it is important because it is likely, because the Eurozone is likely to display a greater risk of asymmetric shock. By asymmetric shock, I mean non homogeneous economic shocks across the different countries of the Eurozone. Uh, you know, for instance, you might have France during, you know, experience here an economic boom, while Portugal is not, or vice versa, by the way. And also because uh, uh, the European Union is clearly less financially integrated in terms of uh, financial services and, and private risk sharing mechanism, clearly less than other monetary unions across, across the world. It's clearly rather underdeveloped. Um, so it is not surprising that as a result of uh, um, uh, the effect that the Eurozone crisis has had across the Euro you know, European countries, there's been a significant debate about the need of developing some sort of a, of a, of a, of a um, um, fiscal union. These are a bunch of documents which has been produced since 2012. I will focus especially on the last one, which is uh, written by the five presidents of the European Union. There is an inflation of presidents in the European Union, but essentially what it does, it includes the president of the European Parliament, of the Eurogroup, the Eurozone countries, the Council of Ministers, and the European Commission, and the uh, European Council. Um, if I counted them all, and the central, of course, and the European Central Bank. Um, so what these uh, reports and um, what it does, it says that it would be important to create in the longer term a um, Euro-wide area fiscal stabilization function, okay, and some sort of a, of a Euro area treasury. And um, um, so that, that is an important idea to deal with these, these policy problems, to deal with these specific pro uh, um, fluctuations. And I have to admit that this is a, a policy which has uh, been supported by even central bankers. This is an article written by Francois Villeroy uh, de Gallo, which is, which is the president of the French, uh, de Gallo, sorry, which is the president of the French um, uh, central bank, Jens Wiedemann, which is the president of the Bundesbank. And these guys are not, you know, um, are not kumbaya singing left wing sort of policy makers, okay? They're very conservative uh, central bankers. But even they admit that there is a need to develop some sort of, of a, a, a fiscal union across the Eurozone countries. So what, what would it be? It would be like a, a rainy day fund to transfer resources that eat recession states, uh, that, that to the two so-called uh, recession eat states, um, some sort of, which might take the form of some sort of uh, uh, centralized succession and spending. Uh, especially to deal with what I've shown you later on about the need to counterbalance uh, probably pro-cyclical or, as we have seen, rather uniform fiscal policies, which has been adopted by Eurozone countries. So, uh, in, in, this is the, just the introduction about this policy. What I'm going to do in this second part I'm going to focus on, um, on whether this policy is feasible or not. And uh, essentially, there are two ways that we might look about the feasibility of this policy, whether there's public support for this policy, and where that support might come from, and whether there is political support from European elite in adoption of this policy. Um, a, a fiscal union, if you know, if from a political economy perspective, it's just it's a so-called tax and transfer public insurance scheme. Okay, what it does, it tax, right, and it transfer a bunch of ma a money, and it is designed as a, as an insurance against um, economic shocks. That's what it is. Okay. Um, so the key question is: Are there what are the con political conditions for the feasibility of this policy? And essentially, as I said, there might be public, the public opinion feasibility of this policy and the uh, <coughs> political elite or procedural feasibility of this policy. I will address the first one and then the second one, okay? which is essentially the most, the most important bit of, my, of, this, of this talk. 
Um, so let's start with the public opinion feasibility of this, of this policy. What I'm going to show you here um, are a bunch of results from experiments that we run about attitudes towards the fiscal um, um, union. So public opinion experiment, essentially. Um, they are only all, they are all based in, in, in Italy. So some of these results are not really, cannot be applied across the Eurozone, but other can be applied. So, of course, so some of these are not really relevant, but that are, in my view, really relevant also for other European countries. So let's talk about public opinion feasibility. What would, what would the public think about adopting this policy? Okay? Or in a way, what would be the correlates of support for these policies? And essentially, uh, political economy tells us there are two essential theories that, um, you know, that explain at least fundamental basic attitudes of, 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 um, of the public toward this policy. The first one is that this is a redistribution policy, it's a welfare state policy in a way, so richer people are likely to be less happy about this because they are likely to contribute more in terms of taxations and they're likely probably to get less benefit in terms of redistribution. Okay? So this is a classical approach. However, this is one approach. The other approach is if you take this, if you see this policy as, a, as an insurance good, right? Uh, um, so it's, a, it's an insurance policy. And if you assume that insurance is a, is a, is a normal good, um, richer people, high income people, would be more willing to buy okay, these, these, uh, um, these insurance goods. Okay? So actually, high, high income respondents should be more in favor because they have more money to buy for this, for this good. There also are a bunch of correlates, but to tell you the truth, I will not focus on those here um, because we, I don't think we have enough time, but we might cover about other possible um, um, correlates. Just I listen here, just, you know, party cues, left eye orientations, identities attitude towards the European Union, and the idea of trust and trustworthiness of political institutions, especially other member states. Um, so, um, what we did here, uh, we ran a bunch of so we did a conjoint experiment to see how people see the attitudes toward this policy. Um, the, the aggregate results cannot be applied across member states, across the other countries, but the analysis from correlates, in my view, are relevant. They can be applied to other countries. Um, essentially, um, we ran them in Italy. They can be applied because um, the correlates analysis is valuable because Italy has been a net contributor to the bailout funds that has uh, that have been used for Greece, for instance, Portugal, and Ireland. Um, and because the Italian public has been aware of these funds, and because uh, um, this has been more technical, uh, because there's been no relation between you know, individual preferences and uh, um, distribution, individual income preferences for the distributions. Um, are not necessarily conditioned by so-called regional income or income of the state. Okay, this is a bit technical. We might go back to that if you have specific questions. Um, Italy is also particularly interesting because Italy has been hardly um, uh, hit by the recession. Okay, but it's been a net contributor. And then you would expect that individuals in lower income states, like for instance Ireland or Greece. Um, which are more likely to face probably um, higher countrywide risk as a result of this, of, of what happened actually in these recessions, might be actually more willing to contribute exactly because they face higher risk, while states in higher income states, they might probably even be more likely to contribute because they're higher income. Okay, so so um, um, like for instance would be Germany, even though you know it's open to question, but that could be at least um, from the insurance perspective, that could be an interpretation of that. Um, so what are the um, correlates? Again, this is just applied to Italy, but it's interesting. What we did, we just explained people what a fiscal union is in a very simple term, and we asked them that whether they were in favor or not. And what is interesting is that, okay, if you see here, as I said, this only applies to Italy, so you, you cannot extend this, but um, um, a significant, uh, part of the Italian public was actually in favor of this policy. However, um, supporters of this policy, if they are, for instance, made aware of the fact that that implies that a bunch of tax, Italian taxpayer monies would be transferred to other 
European zone member states, if they are hit by a recession, they become less happy about that. Okay. So if they made aware, if they made aware that you know what I mean, you are in favor of this policy, but your money is going to be redistributed to other member states when they face a recession, then they become a bit less supportive. Or whether the those who actually initially opposed this measure, when they're made aware, they say, you know what? I mean, if if Italy is it, hit it, by a recession, um, um, Italians are likely to benefit from this policy because a bunch of resources would be transferred by other member states to Italy, which is facing a recession. Well, actually, you know, guess what? They become more enthusiastic. Okay. So essentially, when people are asked, <laughs> introduced about you know, what is a fiscal union, and then they are probed about the redistributive and the, and the risk related implication of this policy, redistributing the fact that they are made aware of the fact that your money would be transferred or you would benefit from this money, and uh, they are made aware of the fact that this money is designed to deal with recession, for instance, or asymmetric economic shocks, their position changes a little bit. But not too much overall. Okay. So, uh, what is the, um, the the interesting result? I mean, this is standard. This is just you no. Know, if we analyze the classical, the correlates of public support, this is very standard. Okay. What we find, we find that our income right wing participant with low trust, low trust towards uh, national or European institutions that they have a very weak European identity, then they have a negative <coughs> attitude towards the European Union, are more likely to oppose a fiscal union. However, and this is really the interesting mm -hmm. results, when people are probed, okay, they're made aware of the risk functions, or the risk <coughs> stabilization functions, the insurance function of this measure, and also the redistributive implications, the low high income divide disappears. With, what actually means is that high income people become more keen to contribute, okay? Which is very interesting, and we'll get into the specific now. Um, so, why do we use conjoint analysis? Conjoint analysis is a, is, a, is, a, is a method that allows to isolate aspects that shape preferences over <coughs> policy that have multiple features, okay? A fiscal union is just, for instance, one element of the European wide economic policy mix and you know and, uh, and a fiscal union depends it might depends on you know how much you tax people to set it up and depends on where, where you spend the money how you spend the money okay so people may be willing to contribute with a little you know, just a little bit not too much and if, if the money is spent in education for instance they might be keen more keen to contribute to this policy i mean imagine any policy that you, know, you you might you might be generally asked to support or be against a specific policy, but essentially it depends on how that policy is designed. Okay. Uh, so what we did we did a, a conjoint analysis and what we involved in these people. Essentially, we we what we asked people we, we designed different type of possible fiscal policies, uh, fiscal sorry, um, fiscal unions. Okay, a fiscal union would uh, you know would imply a specific tax rate. Um, um, would imply whether that tax rate is added or is alternative to the uh, existing taxation, you know, where you spend the money um, and whether that is, is added or not to national spending and who's in charge in terms of institutions and the spending and auditing. So I will only fix on, focus on a bunch of these aspects, but essentially people are asked to, you know, there are different fiscal union schemes and they're asked to vote, okay, for one or the other, or to, or to say whether they prefer one fiscal union scheme or the other one. And guess what? Well, I mean, the more you are asked to contribute, okay, the less likely that you are to support the fiscal union. Well, that is not surprising, okay? What it shows over there that uh, um, just in a very simple terms, on the, uh, you see, those are just the coefficients and they take a negative value what it means is that uh, uh, the higher is uh, the uh, income tax rate of a fiscal union, the more likely are people, um, the more are people likely to reject this fiscal union scheme. Okay, so of course people do not really like to contribute. However, I mean that is obvious. Okay, however, uh, what is interesting is uh, uh, how these attitudes interact with social uh, or individual traits okay social democratic uh, social uh, uh, demographic traits okay 
And generous people, people are not willing to contribute. I mean, they're happy to benefit from policies, but they're not necessarily willing to contribute in terms of being, being taxed. Okay, but what it's interesting me have how does attitude, willingness to contribute, how does that interact with the traits, okay, your social democratic demographic traits? And what I will focus, I will focus on only one here, not, not too much because you know we don't have time here. Employment status. Employment status is a major of income, okay? And this is really the interesting results. What this what this chart is telling us up there is to see. Well, generally, generally speaking, people are not, you know, the higher is the tax rate, the less likely they are to support the fiscal union scheme. They don't want to, you know, to contribute to that. However, as you see that, high income people, they care a bit less, okay? In the sense that um, if, if, if this fiscal union scheme, you know, is going to, if the tax rate is only one per thousand, this is an example of one per thousand tax rate of your income, or, 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 or five per thousand, three per thousand, or five per thousand, you know, people are, high income people, rich people are okay. I mean, they're not, uh, the tax rate is not really a key determinant in, in, in affecting their choices for a fiscal union. If, if the tax rate increases, well, they are, they're more likely to, to oppose this, this, this policy. So what it is telling us is that, um, well, high income response, they do oppose a fiscal union, but the contribution, as long as it is low, not too much, is not a discriminating factor on which they base a choice of different fiscal union scheme. Okay? And that is very interesting. And I'll show you later on why that is very interesting. Um, essentially, they display a greater willingness to contribute, which in a way map the, the result that I showed you earlier on about the fact that when people are probed about the insurance and the distributive attitudes of um, um, the, the insurance and the redistributive implication of a fiscal union, uh, the divide between low income and high income people disappears. Okay. Um, well, there are also other factors, but I'm not going to stop here. I'm not going to talk too much about that. Um, why is this important? Well, this is extremely important for the feasibility of a fiscal union, essentially because um, the high income, high human capital, and generally people that have also high geographical and labor mobility, is normally the core constituency that actually support and generally benefits from the single currency. We know that from all the surveys available out there, the European Union and the Euro, and the Euro itself is mostly supported by, um, uh, no, higher income people with high human capital and, and you know, this is just people that are more likely to support the European Union. So this is actually interesting because those people are also likely that to be more willing to contribute. Then what we did, we did a similar experiment where, where essentially what we asked people in a, in a different sort of setting, these are waves panels, but in a different sort of setting, we asked people to choose between different type of uh, um, uh, Policy, economic policy majors and economic objectives, economic policy objectives, um, where, where the fiscal union is, is one of possible, for instance, uh, um, policy majors that can be adopted at the national or at the European level. Okay? And uh, um, this sounds like a digression, but it is not for the reason that I will show you later on. Essentially, we ask people to choose between different economic policy programs. Okay? that have different attributes, and among those are specific unemployment objectives. Okay, my economic policy, the key objective is to have unemployment rate reduced to 7%, 3%, or 1%. Also inflation objectives, but also a specific attribute of these economic policy programs is whether to have actually what we design, what we explain here as an EU-level spending and taxation, okay? Um, so, um, Essentially, what it meant is establishing some sort of a fiscal union at the, the European Union level, okay? which could be additive or could be alternative to national spending. Um, those in red are the, the conditions at the time of uh, um, doing this experiment. What is interesting, this is the most interesting result, and I show you why this is more interesting. On the, um, you see, those are different economic policy programs, okay? And, and, and uh, coefficients on the left hand side, it means that uh, economic policy programs taking those specific traits are more likely to be rejected 
economic policy programs taking the trade on the right hand side, okay, are more likely to be supported. So the key message of this, that this chart is telling us is that um, if an economic policy program proposes to ditch the euro, to get out of the eurozone, it's significantly likely to be rejected. Okay, so people really don't like that. But equally, up there, as you see, if an economic policy program uh, proposed to reduce significantly unemployment down to 3% or 1%, is significantly likely to be supported. Okay, so you see, those are the two important extremes the euro and unemployment. Okay, so this is actually very interesting. So, what we did out of this exercise that we did, we say, okay, what if uh, uh, we can use the data they were collected and try to estimate how people would trade off between different economic policy objectives? Okay, so for instance, what if people, okay, um, let's say, how do people choose between a policy of keeping the euro but also high unemployment or actually dropping the euro, getting out of this eurozone and getting lower unemployment? I mean, that is not necessarily, you know, that this doesn't imply that if you get out of the Eurozone, you get lower unemployment, but this is like an exercise that can be done with the data that we, that we have here, okay? So really see how people behave if they are faced with these specific choices, okay? Or I mean, there are two choices, which would be keep the Euro and have a fiscal union, or drop the Euro, okay? And so you don't have a fiscal union, okay? The, the behavior is significantly different between high income and low income people. Okay, so that is the key uh, results from this exercise, and I show you now why how this is the key results. On the on your left hand side, you see the behavior of uh, uh, how, how low income people choose when they are faced with those choices, and and on the right hand side, how high income uh, respondents uh, react when they are faced with those choices. So the fundamental aspect is that, you know what, uh, low income people, if if you get lower unemployment, okay, and you teach the euro, they're very happy. They don't mind, okay? If, if, if uh, uh, you see, sorry, on, on, the, on the bottom over there, there are different options, so keeping the euro or ditching the euro, okay? So low income people are perfectly happy to just ditch the euro, get out of the eurozone, if that leads to lower unemployment. Okay, um, while high income people are not, okay? So high income people are not happy to ditch the euro even if that leads to lower unemployment. But what's also equally interesting is that high income people, you know what, what they say? They are still willing to keep the euro even if the euro includes a fiscal union, okay? So you see that what that is actually showing us is that essentially um, keeping uh, the euro with a fiscal union, they're okay, high income people. They're not too worried about that, okay? Because essentially they care a lot about keeping the euro, even if they pay a little bit for it. And in my view, sorry to say that, in my view, they should because they are those who are more likely to benefit out of, out of the, uh, the single currency. So this is important in my view because what it shows us, unemployed low income respondents are ready and willing to drop the euro if that leads to lower unemployment. Higher income respondents are not, and they prefer keeping the currency, even with an even attitude, so something a like fiscal union that adds to, 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 to taxation, over ditching the currency, okay? And I have to emphasize, these are lower bound estimates, because they're very conservative estimates of, of these, of these uh, results. So, um, um, this is just public opinion. So, the, the, the key message is that there seems to be uh, um, at least public opinion feasibility for the establishment of this policy. Uh, but clearly, that could be a necessary condition, but it's clearly not a sufficient condition because this policy is established by political elite, okay? And, and, uh, and they have to follow specific procedures to, uh, to implement those policies. So what is the political elite and procedural feasibility of these policies? And here it gets a little bit more depressing to tell you the truth. OK. Um, um, uh, what is interesting, and I just show you three slides here. I will not go too much into the detail. As you notice here, this is exactly the same part of the statement I showed you earlier on about 
and adding the need to create in the long term a euro area wide fiscal stabilization function. But what's also important there is that that is conditioned, okay, a precondition on this policy is a significant degree of economic convergence, okay? Uh, well, that is a classical catch-22 sort of situation, okay? The reason is because um, a pre what the document is stating is that a precondition to have a fiscal union, you need economic convergence, but it's very likely that you do not get convergence without a fiscal union, okay? Because a fiscal union, it is an instrument that facilitates convergence. <coughs> um, essentially because uh, uh, the synchronization of business cycle is likely to be endogenous to the establishment of a fiscal union, okay? Uh, exactly because a fiscal union has a risk sharing role, okay? And, and so, um, so, so um, clearly if you read the documents, you say, well, this is clearly a catch-22 sort of situation. Um, so, um, however, having said that, um, a few additional comments. Um, clearly, from experience, we have seen that the um, um, European politicians have been willing to act and to save the euro when it was needed. Okay? So, they have shown the determination to take decisive action when the eurozone has been under challenge. Under challenge. Um, what is clear to me that if ever some sort of this policy will emerge, um, it's very unlikely that it will emerge from what I, what I call here highly salient intergovernmental bargains, which these are probably a technical terms, which actually what it means is that these big treaties are normally are adopted in Europe, like Maastricht Treaty, for instance. Those are really high silent, politically silent treaties. I doubt that if this, that this policy will be adopted following this um, um, route towards adoption of these policies because it's very delicate. It's a very delicate um, um, policy. Um, clearly, heterogeneating economic performance that we've sh I've shown you at the beginning of this, of this talk is a clearly a necessary condition, but it's an insufficient condition. One would say that might be po there might be, you know, possibly policy linkages, trade-off, bargains, that might exist. You know, I vote for your policy, you vote for my policy. Uh, it is, they do take place in Europe. Uh, they're not always that frequent to work. Okay, so a log rolling, it's, it's a, you know, could be a way to get to this policy, but um, it, it is not always, um, doesn't always happen. And uh, you, need, you need asymmetries of costs and benefits and contemporaneity of, of, of these problems. So in my view, um, probably the, uh, the way that this policy will be adopted, and this is important, by the way, because I didn't, what I didn't talk about, about here is that the consequences of that increasing divergence clearly is an increase in Euroscepticism and, and very critical attitude towards the European Union. So it has significantly, very high political consequences, those different uh, divergent economic tracks. So what is probably more likely to originate this policy from less silent policies, probably from uh, more, uh, say, what I call legislative and majoritarian politics via the normal day-to-day -day operation of the European Union, not big treaties, but normal day-to-day -day operation of these uh, uh, policies, and essentially majoritarian, where essentially member states do not have veto power. Okay, So that is the way that this policy, in my view, um, to emerge. That's it. <laughs> Question. So why would, for example, Germany, which runs budget surpluses, uh, uh, want to bail out other countries? Well, this is this this will not be necessarily a bailout policy. Okay. Uh, because bailout is a different type of mechanism. This would be more like um, a policy which is designed to address um, um, economic downturns in some countries. Okay, so it's not strictly speaking a bailout because bailout would be related to a country which is under you know speculative tax from financial markets and so on. And, and why would it do it? That, that, that's undoubtedly no. Politically, extremely fundamental questions. 
Well, I mean, there is been, the, uh, the beginning I showed you that there are policies in Europe which are designed essentially to redistribute some resources from, from some regions of the European Union to other regions of the European Union. Um, like the structural funds, the regional funds, the cohesion funds, the Mediterranean programs. So there are some policies which are designed to do that. And the way they've been originated, they've very much been linked to the adoption of new treaties and, and, and uh, um, enlargement process, for instance. So, um, um, so they, they originate from log rolling, okay? So mutual vetoes, essentially. So that's the way they originate. I'm not sure whether that will happen in this specific case. So it, again here, um, if you ask Germany, they would say no. So clearly you would have a veto there. But in the more majoritarian dynamics of the budgetary process of the European Union, where Germany hasn't got a veto, um, where it, what it needs, in, it, it might need a blocking minority, or, or you know, sometimes some of those measures might be designed to address economic downturns, also for some industrial areas in, in Germany, for instance, in Eastern Germany, which might face those specific problems. Um, so uh, probably as a result, it's more, in my view, it's more likely to emerge from that sort of dynamic. So the way you put the question is, is crucial because um, you assume that necessarily Germany has a veto power. And now to be from the treaties, big things, it has a veto power. From the low budgetary decisions, that is less the case, okay? So it, it, that is why I think it's more likely to emerge from that sort of political process rather than from big ideas and process. Why Germany, there might be other political reasons why it's willing to uh, um, do it is essentially because uh, um, what if Marie Le Pen becomes, you know, the president of Germany? Okay, um, I mean, it, it, it might have significant consequences in in, in the way uh, you know the European Union behaves. Uh, um, so the the implication is that the, the extent to which there are policies which are not designed to address this sort of asymmetric economic dynamics might actually lead to significant political challenges, okay? So um, Germany might even see that it is its own interest to contribute to a policy that is designed to address uh, um, these sort of asynchronic um, uh, economic fluctuations. So it might be even be perceived as a benefit from, me, from, from, from the perspective of Germany. Um, so, no, it, it's a fantastic question, but it's, it might emerge from that. I mean, the, the political obstacles are very high, I must admit. But it is significant, however, that um, there is very strong... I mean, this is... Uh, uh, everybody is aware of the fact that the Eurozone is clearly lack of some sort of, a of this sort of measure. And, and it is there... The first, the first policy document written about the Eurozone was written in 1972, the Warner Report, and it also specified, you know what, you, know, you need a common, you, you want a common currency, you need some sort of a common budget that should, you know, should be designed along with a common currency. Um, so everybody's aware of that. And I have to say, what is important is not only, I mean, clearly left-wing people are more likely prone because this is a bit more, you, know, you increase the size of government, of course, by doing so. So you do see that undoubtedly. But I wanted to show that that is not only an opinion which is shared by, by of course, more internationally left-wing and, and, uh, people, but also by some economists which are actually rather conservative, um, essentially because they do see that um, now, this is, can be a significant problem, okay, uh, in, in the inability to address, uh, you know, um, these asymmetric shocks. Um, so, I don't know whether that will happen, but it might be even a benefit from Germany from that perspective. It doesn't want to see a collapse of the Eurozone, which is not something that Germany would necessarily benefit out, out of it. So probably I'm too optimistic. So, please. Yes, uh, has there even been any research done, any projections, whether um, in the absence of this kind of fiscal reform, would this in the short run would jeopardize the economic feasibility of the European zone, the European Union? Uh, well, I mean, um, 
not necessarily apply to the European Union because we don't have this policy, okay? So we cannot, we don't know the impact of this policy in the European Union. No, no, what, we, yeah, what I'm saying is if you don't, if you don't act upon this, if you don't be, begin any, any time frame or any actions for, uh, in regards of making the kind of fiscal policies that you are suggesting. What is going to happen? No, no, no. that jeopardize, if you don't move forward with this, would that jeopardize in any specific time the economic uh, sustainability and, and, and feasibility of the existence of the Eurozone? Um, let's say, I, I, I don't know how would you measure the economic sustainability of the, of the existence of the Eurozone, but if that is major, probably more than economic, we say probably political sustainability of the Eurozone, if that is measured by the rise of anti-European movements across Europe, uh, uh, you know, that, that could be uh, that could be a consequence of, of the lack of this policy. Um, um, so th there's been no studies about uh, the... There's been no study about the import of this policy on, on the economic feasibility of this of the, of the, of the Eurozone. What the studies has been done is the studies of uh, um, what is called um, um, state in, um, income smoothing across different federations, okay? So United States, um, Canada, Australia, and so on and so forth. And uh, all these federations have a degree of uh, um, income smoothing, which is significantly higher than the, um, the Eurozone. Now, people frequently say, well, you know what, but you know, the European Union is not a state. Yes, clearly it is not a state, but economically speaking, it shares exactly the same uh, conditions as as the dollar higher, right? I mean, because their countries share exactly the same currency. Okay, so clearly it is not it is not a state. It has some state-like powers, but uh, uh, economically speaking, they they have all the same monetary policy, and 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 uh, so it is. Uh, you can't compare, at least from this perspective, Canada with the European Union or you know U.S. with the European Union. So let's say. Um, your question would be: Would the eurozone survive if there's no euros, there's no uh, uh, um, um, fiscal union? Um, well, let's say if if it remains being, a, you know, it is possible that it is the least solidaristic monetary union existing in the world. Uh, it can survive. I, I that is difficult to say. I am not sure whether that would be would be the case. At least the early signs by the rise of Euroscepticism and you know the, the result of the Brexit referendum, for instance, uh, those signs are not indicative of the sustainability of the Eurozone, in my view. Um, so uh, you know these signs are Is not. Sustainability really... of the Eurozone or sustainability of the Eurozone without a fiscal policy? Eurozone without a fiscal yeah. policy, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so those those are not indicative of, 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 of that. It, it might be, it might be. I mean, clearly, the point is just to conclude. I mean, th there are alternatives. Other alternatives are, you know, let member states spend more at the national level when they face um, income shocks. Okay, but there are different problems here. Okay, the different problems are: first of all, I show you there is a reason why I show you that third chart that you see that actually heterogeneity in fiscal policy is much lower for the eurozone countries. That is a result of the fiscal policy rules of the European Union. Okay. And, and uh, uh, the essential problem here is, is what happened in Greece. I mean, the, the Euro, Eurozone face a crisis because, uh, I mean, I don't know if there's any Greek here, but uh, essentially because the Greek government you know, essentially cheated with, with regard to his public accounts, right? I mean, he, he misreported systematically his public accounts, um, essentially since 1999, okay? And, and, uh, and so a lot of these measures in the Eurozone crisis was the result of that. And clearly, as a result of that, there's been tightening, controlling national spending, okay? Uh, essentially because, because that led to the Eurozone crisis. So the alternative would be clearly, okay, so let actually member states to deal more, get them more room of maneuver for national spending. But again here, the problem is that that woman who might lead to some sort of a, a, a uncontrolled national spending. So there are clearly different trade-offs going on here. And, and uh, uh, that is why all those European Union co um, um, 
the documents coming out, uh, clearly there is an interest from European Union institution to propose those policies, but also they are perceived as a way, you know, if you don't trust each other, if, if member states of the Eurozone do not trust each other with regard to national spending, and they do not, because of clearly the experience from Greece, and, and uh, which is, by the way, it is not the only country who has cheated with regard to public accounts. Quite a lot of other countries have done so. Not to the extent of, well, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, not, not to the extent of, of, of Greece that overnight, you know, the deficit increased from, I think, 1% to 33% of GDP. Mm. But, but, but that happened, you know, many other countries did, including Italy, with different ways, but they cheated. So if, if, if countries do not trust each other in terms of national spending, you know, uh, uh, probably the best way to deal it. So why don't you have a supranational policy that is, that is designed to manage that problem? Please. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if, I mean, you talked about the tension about identity and, say, Germany and, and kind of veto power. And I was wondering if the key to making a legislative budgetary majoritarian process develop this is to create alternative strong identities and links beyond the state and is there a role for political parties i mean ironically the political parties we hear the most about are the nationalist ones which by definition kind of are separatists but is that a, a, another kind of necessary component to this that that for fiscal union to exist there has to be ties, ideological ties, across states that push for a vision of what fiscal, appropriate fiscal policy would be. That is exactly why, that is a fantastic point, and is exactly why I said that it requires, what I say here, day-to-day um, right. uh, -day budgetary, legislative, majority politics. The reason why I said that is essentially because I had the European Parliament in mind, okay? Mm -hmm. Because especially because the European the way that uh, MEPs vote and you know, behave within the European Parliament, they are essentially cross-national parties. Okay, so that is exactly the point. Okay, that is if you want to develop this policy, you exactly need those other parties which are very weak at the national level, but they are reasonably well organized at the European level, and they are very cohesive in the voting behavior in the European Parliament, and exactly those sort of. Uh, um, international links are developed within the same parties. So the, the European Socialists, the, the Liberals, and the Conservatives, okay? So that is exactly why it is more likely to, to develop in that setting than in a setting of intergovernmental politics, where essentially what it emerges would emerge you know, the veto from Germany or Finland and so on. So ex exactly because within the European Parliament and the role that the European Parliament has in negotiating in the classical what are called legislative procedures with the Council of Ministers, is actually able to develop those those links across across states. So you know you're perfectly right. That is a necessary condition. In order to get there, you need to get the Parliament involved. Um, you need to develop some sort of a common um, political, let's say, um, um, uh, bridge across different countries. Yeah. Yes, please. Well, uh, considering this that Yuri was talking about, uh, how to tackle this fiscal union when you have such a discrepancy regarding the levels of fiscal burden all over Europe? For instance, I'm from Portugal. In Portugal, we have the highest VAT tax of all Europe, like to almost 24%. And on the other hand, the government is desperate for, to raise the level of income. So how to balance, how to tackle this problem? Uh, okay. Um, the, I mean, how to tackle this problem? I mean, clearly, uh, um, you need to develop a policies that um, um, that has a specific European tax base. Okay. Um, and by the way, historically, the European Union and the European, for instance, custom the custom unions as custom duties, which were some of the resources of the European Union. Indeed, you would need uh, a common European tax base, and also, of course, a common uh, which is used to spend on specific measures, uh, which are which are designed to deal with this specific type of risk. So um, that would that would be required. 
there is now um, a team, a group that is, is, that is uh, being set up that is proposing a revision of the um, um, of the revenue side of the European Union, or how the European Union is financed. Okay, there are different mechanisms. There is a, there is a, a group which is uh, chaired by actually by 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 the former uh, president Monti and the Italian the Italian um, the president, um, um, and it is about actually developing some sort of reforming the European um, um, revenues, the revenues of the European Union. Mm -hmm. So um, um, so essentially, you would need some sort of a Base, mm -hmm. uh, to do so, um, and by the way, there is also a lot of talk about um, that, especially for taxations of international companies across Europe, um, where there's been significant problems there. Mm -hmm. Multinational companies have, you know, have very high expertise in trying to avoid taxation across Europe, mm -hmm. and one of the uh, the measures which has been discussed by the Council, the European Parliament. Is really to develop some sort of a, of a common, um, 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 uh, let's say, um, tax based on companies, okay, where you can actually uh, avoid uh, systematic uh, tax avoidance. Yeah. Um, so that could be, for instance, another another um, um, uh, way to finance this program. I mean, to tell you the truth, there are not really there are no technical barriers to this policy. There are only political barriers. Mm -hmm. I mean. You, you know, you can really devise whatever, you know, you have in mind. I mean, you just have to design a tax base. Essentially, what you do, you design, you know, the, the ideally would be to, des to design a policy whose tax base is uh, um, based very much, fluctuates a lot with the business cycle. And then, and then you have a spending program, which also fluctuates a lot with the business cycle. So that's, so technically, I don't see that it's been necessarily difficult to do it. So there are far more political barriers than, than technical barriers, in my view, to develop this policy. Um, I might be naive, but... Uh. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'm wondering what uh, you think the effect of Brexit has had on all this development. The effect of Brexit? Um, well, okay. Uh, it, it is the effect of Brexit. Okay. Um, so far, um, let's say, in terms of how the European Union operates, so at the elite level, really, for the time being, nothing, right? Because the negotiation hasn't started yet, so, so but we, we don't know what actually the British government is going to propose after uh, he, you know, he applied for Article 50 of the treaty. Um, so from that perspective, nothing. But clearly, it has a huge effect on... on um, on the political programs of different political leaders with regard to the message which has been sent out from, from Brexit. Um, so essentially, um, I, I think, you see, you see, essentially, each political leader in Europe interpret Brexit in their own way to maximize their own re-election chances, essentially, okay? So, um, um, from right-wing people would, for instance, interpret it, which is to a certain extent, and all, is a vote against uh, globalization, it is a vote against immigration, and then you need to take those specific policies. Uh, Left-wing people, they would interpret more in this light, okay, they says, well, this is the, the result of globalization, and, and, and hence we do need to set up policies which are designed to, uh, to, to deal with this uh, uh, um, uh, policies emerging from globalizations, because clearly, you now those who were more likely to vote were generally, for instance, uh, uh, well, were, were the victims of globalizations, undoubtedly, were people which have uh, uh, generally lower income, living in the countryside. Um, also, by, by the way, in counties across across England, mostly, that really didn't have a lot of actually immigrants living there, but at, at a higher rate of increase of immigration. Okay. But actually, the counties, the part of which is, by the way, very similar to the US in the, in the current election, um, um, areas in, in England where there were a lot of foreigners working that normally were for remaining. Areas in, in England where normally there were very few foreigners working, but there's been increase over the past 10 years, you have a lot of leave votes. Okay? So, 
Uh, so essentially, that's depend on how you interpret that, okay? So you can interpret it as a vote against globalization and a vote against immigration. And that is very much would be interpreted from right wing politicians, that's the way it would be interpreted. So it's an anti European vote in that sense. From the left wing, it would be interpreted as a vote against uh, uh, the fact that there is not enough measure to compensate people which are affected from globalization. Clearly, this would be a major design to deal with this issue. So the consequence of Brexit, the Brexit, in my view, are interpreted depending on where you come from in the political spectrum. Uh, Brexit, in my view, Brexit itself will make probably these, well, it is hard to say. You, know, you can say it will make this policy harder, less likely to be adopted. Or one who's, who can actually say, you know what, if you have a significant risk of having significantly high you know, increase in Euroscepticism across Eurozone countries, uh, probably, you know, countries like Germany would be more keen to say, well, you know what, why don't we also develop a policy that try to address the problem which were emerged from, from the Brexit vote, okay? Um, so, the, I think that it, it is very hard to say whether uh, it will particularly confident in saying that it will facilitate or will be in the, will, will in the development of this policy. Um, I'm, you know, I don't it's hard to say, in my view, that it will be the case. And uh, negotiation, negotiation with the UK will go on for many, many years, by the way. Um, and probably, you know, this policy as well will take a lot of years to be, to be developed if there's political willingness to do so. Um, we, we will see. I mean, the results are now the agreement with the UK might have an impact on that. How about the new elected uh, president in the United States and the possibility of uh, the U.S. withdrawing from NATO? And how does that affect the urgency of a fiscal policy? And, of and also the how that money would be used in other ways to not just offsetting shocks in different parts of Europe. Yeah. Um, I know it may be a little bit too early, but whether yeah, it is, it, is, it, is, it is very early. Um, um, let's say that um, the most immediate consequences, let's say, there are two types of consequences. The most immediate consequence, probably of this administration, I'm not sure whether that will be the case, will be probably the fact that the so-called TTIP, uh, the, 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 the agreement that the, the, the trade um, did that the European Union and the US were trying to negotiate, uh, it's very likely, probably, that will be will not be negotiated. It will be scrapped. Um, at least from my perspective, this is a, unfortunate because that treaty had, um, had some extremely important aspects and some very interesting um, innovative aspects. The reason is this is the following one. Sorry, that is a bit that is trade policy, but I think it, this is very important. Um, essentially, there are three economic blocks in the world that can determine industrial standards, okay? US, Europe, and China, okay? Those are the three big ones, okay? And um, uh, and the, the, the innovative idea behind the TTIP is to have some sort of coordination between Europe and the US in setting uh, important industrial standards. And that would be, and that if the US and Europe agree on that, that's it, that would be the global standard. So in, in my view, it would be a lost opportunity. Uh, but I, I realize that uh, it, you know, it has no particularly strong political support in, in, in the US. And by the way, it has very weak political support in Europe as well. So, so it's very much uh, um, you know, um, um, uh, objective in Europe as well. But uh, that, that trade agreement was very innovative, uh, exactly for these reasons, because it would give the opportunity to Europe and the US to set global industrial um, um, standards, because that was the key innovative aspect of that uh, TTIP, um, of, of that of the treaty. So, in my view, that's a lost opportunity, but I'm very biased in this, I must admit. Uh, I rather, you know, I'm liberal in terms of economic, economically liberal, so that's that would be my interpretation. Um, the, um, in, in terms of NATO, okay, that is a bit beyond my field of expertise, I must, I must admit, but um, um, uh, clearly, we we'll have implications from the relation, the policy, especially vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, I would say. Um, I, I don't know whether the new U.S. administrations would 
uh, I don't know how, how they are planning to change the policy with regard to NATO. Uh, I, I also have one thing to say, let's say, that um, looking also only at defense spending, um, it's, a, it's a very, it's a rather narrow view to look at the different type of policies that are available there to ensure security and stability. Um, um, it is true that uh, defense spending across European countries is you know, very low compared to the US. Uh, and it is true that uh, uh, it has been increased a lot over the past years. But it is also true that a lot of uh, um, side policies designed for economic development, economic stability, all across Europe has been heavily, heavily financed by European countries, much, much more than the US in Europe. So it is true that European countries have contributed significantly in Ukraine, in, in Eastern Europe, in, 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 the, in the Balkans and so on, to guarantee some sort of economic development and stability. And in a way, it is a different policy instrument because it's not defense spending, but yet it is a policy instrument which has the objective of, of having, secure, the having security, essentially, okay? And it, it, Europe has contributed significantly in those policies. Um, so I think looking only at the defense budget is a very uh, narrow way of, of pursuing stability because one would expect the objective is to pursue stability. It is narrow if you only look at defense spending, in my view. Um, so that what I would say to the new administration that there are other ways, and probably European countries, it's true that they spend less on defense, but they spend a lot of money on, 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 on uh, really um, supporting economic development, links with these countries, ensuring stability. And, and uh, that is also extremely important as well. It's, it's less public, people know less about it, uh, it's less flashy in a way, okay, but it's actually very important as well. That's it. I mean, that's it because it's very hard to say what this new administration will do with regard to that. And uh, that's it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.